final speaker of the symposium today is uh, Dr. Michael Sadelin, who comes to us from the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, uh, Michael has a Canadian connection. He uh, completed his uh, MD in Paris uh, and then came to Alberta, to the University of Alberta, and uh, completed his PhD there. And if I understand it correctly, it's while he was doing his PhD that he first conceived of the idea of using gene therapy and genetic engineering to modulate immune cell function and T cell function. And he went on to, uh, to do a postdoctoral fellowship with Richard Mulligan at the Whitehead, um, and now runs the, um, the cell engineering and uh, uh, unit at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And his lab um, and his work has been instrumental in the development and establishment and realization of CAR T therapies based on chimeric antigen receptor expression in T cells. And it's a therapy now which is having dramatic responses in subsets of patients with leukemia and saving the lives and is, and, and is a, a new therapy which has also just recently received uh, FDA approval. So we're very excited to hear uh, Michael's talk uh, and I welcome here to the symposium. Thank you for the kind introduction, and, and I too would like to thank Janet and the uh, organizing the program committee for the invitation. It's not just an honor to be part of the Gardner Symposium, it's also a true pleasure uh, because it's really a, a celebration of science. As our chair just said, the CAR therapy is a novel form of therapy that's based uh, on the genetic modification of human cells. It is at the same time a cell therapy, a gene therapy, and an immunotherapy. Um, it's not uh, born really in, in immunology per se. In fact, it lies at the intersection of different fields. And of course, we learn first and foremost a lot of, from immunology and tumor immunology uh, about the um, function of T cells, the activation requirements of T cells. And today, we continue to learn a lot from the uh, study of the tumor microenvironment, which we know opposes uh, tumor rejection by immune cells. But this uh, therapy is also heavily predicated on gen genetic engineering, as, as we just heard, which started long ago with uh, retroviral vectors and is now evolving uh, towards the use of targeted nucleases, which is one of the themes I'll be discussing with you today. Um, another unique aspect of this therapy is that it doesn't uh, rely on the use of naturally occurring receptors but rather synthetic receptors designed to instruct and repurpose T cells, something that we named a few years ago a chimeric antigen receptor, or a CAR. And these receptors don't recognize the conventional HLA peptide complexes that normal T cells would recognize. Um, <clears throat> they have different requirements uh, for antigen recognition, and CD19, which I'll introduce to you very shortly, uh, really provided the paradigm for this uh, therapeutic approach. This. Uh, uh, the development of CAR therapy also required establishing novel cell manufacturing uh, processes. Again, these are, rely heavily on the biology of T cell activation, uh, but also on the use of different devices for cell purification and culture. And all of this is also part uh, of the history of CD19 CAR therapy. And, and lastly, but not last, but not the least important, um, this had to um, uh, develop in an unknown uh, regulatory framework, and I should actually thank the FDA, with whom we, we've talked a lot over the years, uh, to put into place manufacturing processes, first in academia, that would be uh, acceptable to conduct these trials, and, that, and today that are taken over by some, some startup companies or big pharma. Uh, as a minimal introduction to immunology here, I just want to remind you how the T cells normally recognize antigen. They make use of this alpha-beta heterodimer known as the T cell receptor, that recognizes HLA peptide complexes on the surface of antigen-presenting cells, which could be uh, tumor cells, virus-infected cells, or other cells. This heterodimer alone does not signal. It is associated with a complex of molecules known as CD3, made up of the gamma, delta, epsilon, and zeta chain here that you notice here. Uh, in concert, this um, complex uh, triggers, uh, following recognition of antigen, the activation of a T cell. And while that is the, the gatekeeper, if you like, of, of any immune response, it is not alone sufficient to initiate a productive and effective immune response. For that, you need to also engage 
a number of other receptors known as co-stimulatory receptors. These belong to two main families, uh, the immunoglobulin superfamily, CD28 being the best known and most studied of these uh, members, and members of the TNF receptor family, such as 4-1-BB, which I'll come back to a bit later. And it's the concerted action of these uh, multiple uh, molecules that again leads to a productive immune response. So in wanting to engineer and repurpose T cells, this created a, a need, if you like, to design receptors which uh, in a single molecule encoded by a single cDNA could provide as much information as possible. And to the right is what we call a second generation CAR, which has three canonical components, an SCFV com comprising the heavy and light chains of an immunoglobulin, which is used to uh, recognize antigen. And that recognition will proceed independently of HLA, unlike the natural T cell receptor, and needs to recognize molecules that are on the surface of tumor cells. The green chain that you see here, you recognize the component uh, zeta chain of the CD3 complex initiate activations. And the third component here, co-stimulation, enhances the function and persistence and alters the metabolism of these T cells. A brief history, very brief, uh, could be as follows. That zeta chain that I just highlighted, you have, might have noticed that it lacks an extracellular domain. And when three groups ind independently cloned the cDNA for CD3 zeta in the early 90s, they created these fusion receptors shown here, introduced them in leukemic T cells, cross-linked them, and in doing so discovered that the zeta chain was sufficient to initiate T cell activation. And then an investigator in Israel, Zelegashar, put a twist on this by uh, substituting an SCFV on these molecules, and therefore creating zeta chain fusion proteins that could recognize different molecules, a haptin initially. He called these a T body. But because we could introduce genes in primary T cells, having figured out ways to uh, uh, transduce primary normal T cells, we realized that, first of all, these uh, uh, T bodies, as he named them, could only redirect specificity, but not lead to a productive immune response. And at the same time, we developed these co-stimulatory receptors, chimeric forms of them, again based on C28 here, which taught us that we could redirect co-stimulation in antigen-specific fashion. And it's the fusion of these two here, leading to what I call the second generation CAR, that is the foundation for all the clinical results that have uh, come through in recent years. We needed to identify a target for our program. We set our eyes on CD19. CD19 is a cell surface molecule, can be recognized by CAR. It's expressed in the vast majority of leukemias and lymphomas. We knew that it was also expressed on normal B cells and predicted, therefore, that CAR T cells would eliminate normal B cells as well. But even if that is not ideal, that is clinically tolerable. You can live at least for some time uh, without B cells if you're given an intravenous immunoglobulin. And in this study, which is um, 14 years old now, uh, we provided the first demonstration that you could take human T cells, engineer them with a CAR specific for CD19, and eliminate uh, established lymphomas or, or leukemias. You here see on an FDG PET scan the distribution of this lymphoma in this mouse. And long-term remissions, in fact, cures in mice given a single, a single infusion of the CAR T cells. So we decided to proceed to, to a clinical study, and for that had to first build a GMP facility. And GMP stands for Good Manufacturing pr Practices and needs a special environment to manipulate and culture patient cells, and also devise a, a manufacturing process that could pass muster with the FDA. This was accomplished by my colleague, Isabella Riviere. And so we start from a patient apheresis, collecting T cells from the peripheral blood. Uh, some commercially available beads were, uh, coated with CD3 and CD28 antibodies were used to purify the T cells and expand them. And then we introduced the gene coding, the, uh, coding for the uh, CAR using gamma retroviral vectors, which we produce, in fact, uh, in our facility on our floor. The cells are cultured in these bags that you see here. They're about one liter bags. The cells are cultured today for nine, 10 days, and that will be shortened very soon. At the end of the process, the beads are removed. They're iron beads. You can do that, actually, believe it or not, with a magnet. And the cells are then uh, frozen for deferred use or can be infused immediately, if need be, to, to the patient. And so this is from the, the first report from our lab, from our center, of the, on the uh, efficacy of CD19 CAR T cells in subjects and patients, adults, with refractory relapsed uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. 
These patients have received several cycles of chemotherapy. Some of them are relapsing after a bone marrow transplant, and they have weeks to months to live. And I'll just show you these facts analysis here on their bone marrow samples. Here from subjects four and five, this paper reported on the first five adults treated with this therapy. All these cells here at day minus four, day minus one, are tumor cells expressing CD19. As you see here on day 11, 24, 59, you see the complete obliteration of any CD19 positive cell. And above here, you'll notice that at the same time, normal hematopoiesis is recovering, and that's because this is a, a targeted therapy. This would definitely qualifies as what's called a complete remission. It's more than that. If you sequence, if you do deep sequencing on genomic DNA extracted from the marrow of these patients, Again, focusing on the two more dramatic subjects here, four and five, you'll see on day minus four, there's two million transcripts per fixed amount of genomic uh, RNA, malignant transcripts. Um, day 11, 1,000, day 24, 600, undetectable by day 59. So somewhere between day 24 and 59, the tumor becomes undetectable by deep sequencing. In subject five, it's even more dramatic. There's these three million transcripts on day minus one. And as early as day eight, the tumor is eradicated. So later that year, we were, of course, very pleased when science proclaimed a cancer immunotherapy to be the breakthrough of the year. Um, the uh, lion's share of this, if you like, went to checkpoint blockade, a form of immunotherapy based on uh, the use of antibodies that release uh, endogenous immune responses. But the uh, uh, editors also saluted this uh, emerging immunotherapy, uh, mentioning the work from three groups our own from Sloan Kettering, but also comparable studies performed at the National C Cancer Institute by Steve Rosenberg and at the University of Pennsylvania uh, by Carl June. Both of them had noticed our papers and also undertaken uh, studies comparable to ours. And so here's just a summary of uh, some of these results re reported in, in, in recent years. Uh, in adult ALL, as you see, a complete remission rate of, of 88% from CHOP, from, from Carl June and colleagues. In pediatric ALL, 90% complete remission rate. And overall comparable results here from now for four different groups using C19 CAR therapy for ALL. Uh, below here in, in non-Hodgkin lymphomas or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which are also malignancies expressing the C19 molecule, you also see these are impressive completion complete remission rates, even if they're not quite as high, as for ALL, which is really the poster child for C19 CAR therapy. So <clears throat> just to take a step back and put a bit of a historical context here, I just would say that first that T cell therapies did not start with CAR therapies. Uh, they, they started really in the late 80s. Um, T cells themselves were discovered uh, by Jacques Miller or their or origin in the thymus in the early 60s and entered the clinic uh, really in the late 80s using um, cultured T cells from uh, melanoma patients that were expanded with IL-2 called LAC therapy and then a refinement of this using the tumor itself as the source of the T cells in a therapy called TIL therapy. And then the transplanters, uh, to avoid graft-versus-host disease, used donor T cells and started isolating virus-specific T cells to treat infections in their bone marrow transplant recipients without inducing graft-versus-host disease. And as I already told you in the parallel, uh, starting from the, the um, early 90s, the beginning of primary T cell engineering leading to the design of these cars, um, these first trials starting in 2010 and 11. And as was already noted, the approval uh, this year, uh, two approvals in 2017 of the first CAR therapies. And I'll come later back in a few minutes to the emergence of yet another wonderful tool to advance these therapies based on T cell gene editing. Another high level, perhaps, uh, um, uh, analysis or reflection on all of this is that the T cell therapies that existed for the last 20 or 30 years these LAC, TIL, DLI, donor leukocyte infusion, and virus-specific T cells all relied on natural T cells. Going to the donor or going to the patient and trying to identify and then expand naturally occurring T cells. And the new paradigm that I think is supported by CAR therapy now is not one of looking in the patient for a good T cell, but, but making the T cell and using gene transfer and editing synthetic receptors 
The concept now is that if you don't have T cells that protect you against cancer and perhaps uh, infectious diseases or autoimmune disorders, we will make those cells for you. And in the case of CARS, I think it goes one step further. It's not a natural gene that's being introduced into the, the genome of patient cells. These are synthetic genes. And so I think that the CD19 CAR story uh, will be sort of a, a first for, for, for a new approach to some medical problems. So here's where we stand at least at ASCO last year with 45 patients with, uh, um, uh, treated with CD19 CAR therapy for their uh, relapse and refractory ALL. We're at about 60 patients with this disorder today, but here's what we presented. And there are three points I, I want to make from this survival slide. Note that for the longest time, this therapy has been discussed in terms of inducing a complete remission, which is, of course, the first thing you want. But the, the real reward <coughs> is long-term survival. In blue here are the 15% or so of patients who don't go into a, a molecular complete remission. And as you see, they will relapse, and they will progress and die from their disease. The second point is of those 85% or so of patients who go into molecular remission, about half of them in adults, a little bit more in children, will uh, benefit from durable survival, where some of these now have exceeded five years recently. And the third point is that there's still about half of the patients in molecular CR who do relapse. So clearly what it means to us is that there's room for improvement. These CD19 cars have just been approved but there's room for improvement to make everyone respond <clears throat> and, of course, to avoid these uh, relapses that still do happen in some of the patients. There are also toxicities associated with these CAR therapies. I already mentioned the uh, uh, depletion of CD19 positive, of normal B cells, I'm sorry. But that, in the end, is, uh, first of all, manageable and, secondly, transient, because in most patients, these T cells do not persist indefinitely. They eventually go away. And when they do so, a normal B cell lymphopoiesis uh, resumes. But there, is, there are two other toxicities that are problematic. One is a term we coined of uh, cytokine release syndrome. And when it is severe, there are not just high fevers, but hypotension, respiratory insufficiency. And some of the patients have to go to the ICU, especially adults <coughs> who may not handle that as well as, as children. And then there are neurological changes that occur, delirium, aphasia. They're transient, but they are clinically impressive. Um, even um, these aphasias, for some patients, for two, three days, they can't talk. So in the beginning, we didn't know what this was. We still don't know the cause of it. But by now, patients, nurses, their families, the physicians all expect it. And again, it is usually reversible. The point I'd like to make from this slide is that in ALL, uh, we can anticipate at least who might develop a severe CRS, uh, and it's really the patients with high tumor burden. So if you have more than 5% blasts in the marrow, you can see 40 or 50% of these patients will have one of these two toxicities. And that means those patients we keep in the hospital. And this affects the way these drugs have been approved today. They are approved in the US, but they can only be administered in a few centers because for these patients, the drug has to be administered under special care. On the other hand, if you have low tumor burden, you're still chemorefractory relapsed and would die from your disease. Those patients are fine. You can get the CAR T cells, go home, call us if you have a fever. So that means, too, that there is room for improvement uh, in designing these CAR T cells. In fact, there are a lot of things that could be improved. Uh, it may have taken 25 years to get to this point, which is a you know, a great story in itself, but on the other hand, I think we're just at the very, very, very beginning of these new engineered uh, medicines, and there's a, a lot to, to discover yet uh, in terms of how to better target different tumors. Uh, there's still a lot to improve on the biology of these T cells, uh, using the right subsets, the right phenotypes. Uh, uh, adapting these T cells to uh, more um, aggressive metabolism, uh, uh, metabolic conditions, I'm sorry, in some tumor microenvironments. Uh, there are things to do to improve the applicability of these, um, the broader applicability of these therapies. And this, uh, in this regards, I'm thinking about manufacturing. There's a lot of miniaturization, robotization that's required and already starting to happen. 
And of course also the, the idea that you could not, no longer just rely on an autologous therapy, but use uh, donor T cells if they were suitably designed uh, is also another uh, grand goal uh, lying ahead. Uh, you can use these T cells to do a lot of things for you, not just kill the tumor, and because they infiltrate uh, the, the, the tumor microenvironment, they can be used to accomplish a lot more for you. They can release molecules, alter the microenvironment, and some, some of our clinical studies are starting to address that. And again, on the level of safety, there's definitely also room for improvement. So I can't address, of course, all of this, but uh, there's two stories that I would like to, to tell you about looking at sort of next steps in C19 car therapy. Here are the two cars that are approved today. One um, commercialized by Novartis, uh, which uses this 4-1-BB signal, and one um, commercialized by Kite, now Gilead, that uses uh, exactly our CD28 uh, sequence. Um, and I'd like to show you how these um, uh, T cells perform in a mouse model uh, which we call a stress test. Uh, it's a xenogenic model. Uh, mice are, are infused with CD19 positive acute lymphoblastic leukemias and then <clears throat> infused with uh, these CAR T cells. If you give a million T cells or more not shown on this slide, you could cure these mice, but the stress test that we use now to gauge the potency and other features of these T cells is based on the idea that you de decrease this T cell dose to a point where at least some CAR designs just don't work anymore. And as you see here, 200,000 CAR T cells per mouse. Um, neither the 28 or the BBZ CAR are, are successful. They can just slightly delay tumor progression. The first generation CAR T body, of course, is, is completely ineffective. But it's informative to, to analyze in mice what's going on with these T cells. We can't do that very well in patients. And so here's what you find on day 7, seven 14, 21. And although this is a mouse, I'll remind you that most of the therapy in the patients with ALL takes place in roughly those three, three, four weeks, as I showed you before. So if you look at the marrow, which is a site of disease for these leukemias, there's a certain number of these first-generation CARs, and both the 28 and BB-based CAR T cells here are more abundant, 20 or 30-fold more. That's that little co-stimulatory domain that I highlighted in that second-generation CAR at work. That's what you see here. And the numbers of T cells here at this time point are neck and neck. And yet the activity on the tumor is completely different. The 28Z car has already eliminated uh, the tumor, almost like subject number five that I showed you before, but not the BB-based car. And this is a log scale. Same number of T cells, 10 times more tumor. The 28Z car then starts decreasing in number day 14, and by day 21, it's no better than that first generation car. And that's in contrast to that BBZ car. You see the number day 14 is even higher than a day seven before it eventually goes down. And while it is a less potent effector, it persists longer and over time eliminates the tumor. And the reason I emphasize this is not just that we find this in the mouse model, but it really mirrors very well what we see in the patients. The 41 bb T cells persist longer, the 28Z cars are explosive, if you like, but of short durability. And overall, the CR rate in AL patients, as I showed you in the clinic, is the same. But we're interested in these different ways of getting to the result, and we really want to capitalize on both pathways, the CD28 for efficacy and 41BB, if you like, for durability. And so here's how we're designing T cells now. And for this, I have to remind you of a few things that happen on the surface of T cells when they see antigen. This is a first generation CAR. You see that zeta chain for activation here. It could be a T cell receptor seeing an HLA peptide complex. This initiates T cell activation, also known as signal one. Most T cells constitutively express the CD28 costimatory receptors shown here. And if the antigen presenting cell has one of its two ligands, CD80 or CD86, there's now what's called signal two provided to these T cells. But things change very rapidly at the cell surface uh, upon this interaction. CTLA4, an inhibitor of the C28 circuit, comes to the cell surface. And now members of the TNF receptor family, such as 41BB, appear on the surface of the T cell. And if the antigen presenting cell has the ligand, for example, for 41BB, this will provide co-stimulation leading to greater persistence of these T cells. 
Now, of course, tumor cells don't express these ligands, such as CD86 or 41BD ligand. And so one approach that, what, that we reported already a few years back but have now refined is one where these ligands are expressed in the T cell. That's the wrong side of this synapse, if you like. But what it means is that wherever the T cell goes, the ligands are there, even in a tumor microenvironment lacking these uh, ligands. And so here's just the activity now of cells that are designed in the following way. This is the 28Z car that I just showed you before uh, in, in our clinical uh, series, uh, co-expressed with the 41BB ligand. This here is the 41BB car co-expressed with the ligand for CD28. This is a triple signaling domain, and this is the first generation car co-expressed with the two ligands. And this is now, again, a snapshot of these um, stress tests. It's the same dose of 200,000 CAR T cells per mouse. You can see this is a, a slight improvement. This fails completely, and clearly the winner is here. It is the 28Z CAR with 41BB ligand. And I don't have time to show you that this um, expands um, the, uh, uh, or, or promotes the expansion of these T cells, uh, maintains their functions, and diminishes their exhaustion. And so that's what we have now brought to the clinic. I don't yet have results to report. We just treated three patients in the last two months with a very low dose because we and the FDA agree that these cells are so extraordinarily potent that you should give very few. We're giving a hundredfold fewer than what we are giving in these other uh, ongoing trials. We also have a safety switch, EGFRT, such that we could deplete these cells if need be using an antibody to EGFR. The significance of this, we hope, will be, to, to, um, will be uh, on multiple levels. First of all, if you can make better T cells, then you should need fewer T cells, and that means that your manufacturing requirements will go down in scale and cost. The second thing which we're most excited about, but totally unknown, is whether their safety will be improved, because if you can be very active with a smaller T cell number, we predict, we don't know of course, but we predict that the toxicities will be greatly diminished because at every center, everybody agrees that these toxicities occur when you have very high levels of T cells uh, in the patient. And again, a population of cells that's active at lower numbers, one could say, might avoid that. That remains to be proven clinically, but it's uh, in progress. I'd like to turn about to, to, to genetic engineering as another approach that I think will greatly impact the next, the evolution of CAR therapy. So yes, when I left the University of Alberta wanting to engineer T cells, I went to the Whitehead Institute and it took me two and a half years to get to this darn result here, showing a little bit of gene transfer using in T cells. Uh, this is old, this is before uh, GFP, we used LAXZ, we did southern blots to demonstrate gene transfer, authentic gene transfer into cells. Today we can teach a high school kid how to put genes in 100% of T cells in, in one afternoon. Anyway, after two years and a half we got this. We use gamma retroviral vectors in our current trials. Others have used lentiviral vectors. Some people use transposons such as Sleeping Beauty or Piggyback. A common, point, a common feature of all of these uh, engineering devices is that they integrate randomly in the genome of, of, of the T cell. And of course, we've been very closely following the developments in recent years of these wonderful new tools, these targeted nucleases that could allow you not just to disrupt genes, but to insert uh, your, your favorite gene at defined locations. And we started using CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce uh, the CAR cDNA at chosen locations in human peripheral blood T cells. So here's that same car that I've been telling you about for a while, 1928Z, which we are now introducing into the locus, the codes for the alpha chain of the T cell receptor at this particular position. The important detail of this construct here is that it lacks a promoter. We will thus place the cDNA under the control of the natural T cell receptor promoter enhancer in locus control region. So below, I show you here the, the efficacy of this approach. Uh, if you just expose the cells to the donor DNA, uh, nothing really happens. They keep their T cell receptor, and they don't express any of the CAR. 
When we transfect the Cas9 mRNA and, and guide RNA, you can see now that's in this case, 69% of the cells become T cell receptor negative, and that's because we are disrupting the alpha chain locus. And as we add donor DNA here, you can see in the last panel, for example, this population of cells that we're very interested in, these are T cells that lack a physiological T cell receptor, but have a car on their surface. And so the first thing that we anticipated was that now we should get more uh, homogeneous expression of the CAR, and that's what you see here in four donors. This is a fax analysis of cell surface expression of the CAR, and you can see the peak at the same position. The same donor, same time, but uh, transduced with a retroviral or lentiviral vector would show you this, these, these wide peaks. The average expression tends to be slightly higher, by the way, but really it's a broad peak. That means that some of these cells express 100 times, four, maybe even more, car than some of these cells. That is owing to some variability in copy number and mostly gene variegation. And same thing here with the mean fluorescence in 12 different donors. This we expected, a more homogeneous, if you like, profile of the CAR T cell. But this then is what surprised us. We're back to that stress test again. And now looking at 200,000, 100, even 50,000 CAR T cells per mouse, it's the same leukemia model that I showed you before. And after this electroporation and under these conditions, 200,000 CAR T cells generated with a conventional retroviral or oral antiviral vector, they don't work anymore, as you see here. But the track CAR T cell does. Even at 50,000 CAR T cells in these mice, there, there are prolonged um, delays in tumor progression. So what could account for that? Well, first we again enumerate the T cells in the marrow at the site of disease here on day 10. And in blue here is the number of track CAR T cells. And in green, <coughs> the uh, conventionally uh, generated T cells. And in red is a, a control also that was in the previous slide that I had not highlighted, where we disrupt the T cell receptor, but introduce the CAR with a randomly integrating vector. And as you remember, those didn't work very well either, which, by the way, supported the idea that the superior function of the track CAR T cells is not owing to the deletion of the um, uh, endogenous T cell receptor, but rather accounted for by the different regulation of expression of the CAR cDNA. So back to this, on day 10, the cell numbers are roughly the same between these three groups. They start decreasing with the conventionally made T cells, and at the same time, looking at the tumor in the same animals, you see the tumor starting to escape. And you remember, there was no therapeutic benefit in these mice. And the track CAR T cells, in contrast, maintain these numbers and are clearly eliminating the tumors. You see here, day 10 already, they did part of the job. And by day 17, it was gone. That fits the survival curves that I showed you. And so this suggested exhaustion of these T cells that were conventionally generated. And that's what we see in their phenotype. Um, conventionally, cells that co-express PD-1, LAG3, and TIM3 highlighted when they express the three here by these black rims, are exhausted. There's additional evidence not shown here from transcription factor profiles. And that's in contrast to the track CAR T cell. It is not exhausting, at least at this time point. And why is that? Well, <clears throat> we started uh, um, incubating these uh, track or conventional CAR T cells with antigen. And so here I'll just show you what happens when you do that. On a monolayer of cells in vitro, of cells that express CD19, the target antigen. And this is over 60 hours, and we're faxing on the cell surface the expression of the CAR. This is a, a relevant CAR, not specific for CD19. And you can see that in this uh, retrovirally engineered human T cell, the level of CAR doesn't really change in this experiment over this time. The track CAR T cell, now seeing CD19, behaves very differently. You see this great reduction at 12 hours. It's a log, deple log depletion, really and it comes back to the surface with a certain kinetic. The retrovirally engineered cells behave differently. Again, time zero, that broader peak that I showed you before, there's kind of a vague decrease, and then there's this rebound that you see here, which we didn't see. This is rebound, I say, is above baseline, and this is summarized from several experiments and much more data than I have the time to go through that shows you the kinetics of the car uh, at the surface of the T cell following engagement of antigen. So at the track locus, this is great depletion, comes back by 36 hours with the conventionally engineered T cell. 
there is a decrease, which is less, and this, there's a rebound. And when these cells rebound, we show are very, they're very good killers. They're ready to kill. In fact, if you're interested in serial killing in vitro assays, which means in a relatively short term, they're wonderful. But the way we interpret these data is that, in fact, they may be great in an 18-hour assay and make you happy, but you need your T cells to function for weeks to really clear a tumor, and they need a break. And that's what this, this is, this is what's happening when the track uh, car encodes, when the track locus encodes the car. I didn't have time to show you that we demonstrated that this car is internalized, degraded, and therefore needs de novo translation from the uh, 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 transcripts of the car originating from the track locus, explaining why transcriptional levels are so important. So is the track uh, locus unique? Well, we started engineering human T cells at different loci and also with different promoters, which are shown here. Some are weak and some are strong. And um, we explored many, more than these four, but uh, because of time, I'll just show you these four examples. Here's um, a track locus, but with an LTR driving the car, not the endogenous promoter. Here's the beta-2 microglobulin and endogenous promoter, and that's the level of car expression at baseline again. This is blue, which is here, the blue of the track car, we're taking as reference. And the EF1 alpha, a stronger promoter, gives you higher expression. As you notice here in this uh, stress test again, there's a very clear difference. The track locus wins, which means that these you know, relatively subtle differences here in the expression of the car make an enormous difference to the function of T cells. And so at this time, we're scaling up. We have scaled up the process and hope to, 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 to open by next summer uh, a um, car T cell trial in which the um, T cells will be gene edited um, using uh, the track locus uh, as the site for expressing the car. Before concluding, I just want to uh, say one more thing about uh, where to apply car therapy and put it in the context of other immunotherapies. And again, this checkpoint blockade uh, that I already mentioned that I'm sure uh, all of you have heard of, this is uh, um, based on the use of antibodies which are inhibitors of immune responses such as CTLA-4 or, or, or PD-1. And um, I think everybody's seen this graphic many, many, many times, which reports the uh, uh, mutation burden in, in different cancers. Um, checkpoint blockade was initially very successful in melanoma, then lung cancer, and then a few other cancers. And one common feature of these uh, tumors that respond to checkpoint blockade, sort of highlighted here in gray, is a very high mutation burden. 200, 400, 1,000, sometimes more than 1,000 mutations, 2,000 mutations per cell. And some of those mutations are immunogenic, creating what's called neoantigens, and some patients have enough of those T cells that they can be unleashed uh, by checkpoint blockade therapy. But this therapy is less effective in patients that have small, tumor, small mutation burdens. In fact, in, in this red box here, I've highlighted ALL, where I just showed you. Uh, uh, our clinical results. And based on this uh, concept, we think that one area to prioritize uh, CAR T cell therapy is all those cancers with relatively low mutation burdens, which are um, less likely to respond to checkpoint blockade. We're now mounting a big effort for AML. And AML on diagnosis, on average, has about 10 mutations. We're very far from the 500 mutations or so in, in lung or melanoma. So this is where we think that um, car therapy should be prioritized, and at this time we are uh, looking very much for, for suitable targets to develop uh, new car therapies. So to summarize, for what I showed you anyway, the 41BB ligand extends our persistence of these CAR T cells, and that we think will be, um, I should say, extends persistence while maintaining function of these CAR T cells, which we hope will turn into a great benefit. We also think that uh, gene editing is poised to really have an enormous impact on the future of these T-cell-based therapies, not just for cancer, but again for, for autoimmunity and severe infections as well. Um, there are too many people to acknowledge, but I will just mention uh, two of my long-standing colleagues for all of this work. Uh, Rainier Brentians, who was a fellow and now is the head of a cell therapy service that we've established, uh, and Isabel Riviere, who has uh, um, build uh, an incredible uh, GMP facility that makes 
all of our trials possible. Uh, thank you for your attention.